Good morning, Grace. Hey, before we get started uh, this morning, I just want to bring some people up uh, to just thank and, and honor from our leadership team and our staff and, and different people that have served in our transitioning uh, in the next few weeks. And so we want to bring Grant and Kira up. Grant's one of our deacons and Kira, our children's ministry director. Uh, we have David Gonzalez. Is David here? David's one of our deacons as well. I'm going to bring him up. Come on over here. And then I want to bring up Eric and Bea, our summer uh, student ministry directors. that are going to be transitioning out as well. <laughs> How y'all doing? Doing good. Well. Good. They get to do this three times, so bear with them. Actually, th- this is a, you know, a bittersweet in a lot of ways for all of you guys. It's sweet because it's just been a blessing having you guys part of our ministry at various times throughout the years. Grant and Kira, I'll start with you guys. You know, Kira, both your ministry with our children and just the leadership you brought to that team, the team that you've built and the strength that that's brought to a ministry that just ministers you're greatly to the kids of our church. You've done a phenomenal job and, and just the team you've left is a testament to your leadership and faithfulness serving there. So stop crying. <laughs> this is a happy time. We're talking about the good things. Yeah, we have Grant, just the blessing of having you as a deacon and, and just you guys as a family, just the journey you've gone on uh, is, as a couple, the way you've lived it openly with our congregation and loved and, and ministered to people even through that, uh, just the faithfulness you've had in serving this church body while you guys are here is a huge blessing. Grant was our deacon. I'd just stick him right by the door outside and just have him look like this. And then basically we didn't have any problems with people coming in and <laughs> causing trouble. So anyways, we're going to deeply miss you guys. They're transitioning back to Florida, which is where their families are at. And so we're going to miss you guys deeply and are thankful for your time here. David, David's a, a deacon as well. Jennifer, his wife, wasn't able to be here. They're kind of transitioning to San Antonio where they uh, had lived for a number of years before coming to Laredo. And so, again, David, you know, you've worked with the youth. Jennifer's worked with the kids, the youth. You guys came in and dove right in and brought your experience, brought your love for Christ and just your love for people and have, have blessed this church tremendously in the years you've been here. We're going to miss you guys as well and are so thankful for that. Uh, time you've been here. I have hair envy, I'm just saying. <laughs> just give me, give me a moment just to pretend. <laughs> you guys have been, um, Bea, you've obviously been here for a while. Your family's been here, uh, and, and you've been a blessing that whole time. Eric, it's just been a blast to have you down here this summer. You know, you've loved on the kids, done such a great job just serving them, leading both of you guys, leading the trips and just being engaged in their lives. I know you've left a lasting impact on their lives. We're going to miss you guys as you transition, as you take off for more school. And Eric, as you head back to Rhode Island uh, and jump back into things, you guys have been a huge blessing. So we just want to say thanks as a church body uh, and pray for all you guys as you transition to the next season. So let me pray for them. If you just bow with me as we uh, just thank God for their lives and, and, uh, and pray that he'll bless them and, and keep them as they move to the next place that he has for them. Father, we love you and just praise you for the gift of the body of Christ. And Lord, just as your word says, you've appointed times and seasons for people and places. Uh, Lord, we know that um, People come and people go. All of us have been in those circumstances. Sometimes we're on the receiving end of that. Sometimes we're on the going end of it. But Lord, your faithfulness keeps us uh, all along the journey. And so we are so thankful for the time that we've had with these families and these individuals, the blessing they've been to this body and the joy they've brought and love they've shown to so many people. And we just pray that you continue to bless them and guide them as they transition to this next season for each of them. Lord, that you would quickly connect them into your body in that new location, that they could uh, establish the friendships, the support, and the place to minister and follow you that they've had while they've been here. We're so grateful for their lives and for the blessing they've been to this church and just ask that you would bless them as they transition. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate you guys. Out of Grant. I'm sick. <laughs> Stick him in the back there still. Hey, uh, on a side note with that, Eric, as you know, or may not know, is from Rhode Island. And when he came down here to do this summer internship, he drove uh, at his own expense to, stay, to get down here. It's a long drive by himself. We'd really like to bless him as a church and cover his expenses going back. Uh, as he drives, takes off basically this afternoon, he's going to start the drive back to Rhode Island. So I want to encourage uh, each of you, but in particular parents, if you've had kids in middle school or high school that were just blessed by his ministry this summer, would you just drop uh, some cash? It doesn't have to be a huge amount. If everyone would participate, we want to cover his expenses going back. We'll have a basket at the back of the sanctuary on that little table. As you leave today after our offering, you can just drop something in there for him to be a blessing to him and help him get back and not have to incur those expenses on his own. So we're very thankful uh, for the commitment they've made here. Hey, before I jump into the message, I just want to revisit our fall series. Eddie announced that our small groups are starting to sign up. Uh, it's series this fall is going to be Wise Up, uh, and, and it's out of the wisdom books of the Old Testament. There's a whole section of books that are called the wisdom books like Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Those are books that give us uh, wise truths on how to live well on this earth. And so we're going to address two of what I believe are uh, the key areas in our lives where we as a people in our culture and in our world do not live wisely. They're probably two of the most foolish areas in which we live uh, right now that we're going to address. And one of them is in our sexuality and just romantic life. And the other is in our resources and our money. Probably the two areas that have become idols and probably brought the most amount of damage into our lives is in those two areas because we have not incorporated wisdom into them. So we're going to be going through the book of the Song of Solomon, which is all about the sexual relational aspect of love in a relationship. And we're also going to look at uh, things from the Proverbs and from Ecclesiastes about how we steward our money and how we handle those two areas. So I want to encourage you, the messages will be important, but the time you spend in a small group engaging with others, talking about those issues, uh, praying for one another is absolutely vital to your growth. So if you've never been in a small group before, I want to challenge you, let this be your first one. Step out and give it a try uh, and see how much of a difference it makes in your life when you start developing relationships in your life that encourage you to live a wise life in areas that are, are very important. So a, a good series coming up. You're not going to want to miss out on that as we kick off in September. If you've been with us, you know we're in the midst of a series right now called Timeline, and we've been going through the, uh, the ninth chapter of Daniel. If you're new to us, uh, ultimately what this is is a series that's giving us a little bit of a framework for end time events, what's going to happen and, and when God's, or how God's spoken about them. And in Daniel chapter 9 is one of the key prophecies in the Old Testament that many scholars say is the backbone of all of prophecy. It's kind of a 40,000 foot view of these things that allows you to set some of the other prophecies in the Bible in place and see them in that greater context. So we started last week uh, looking at the prayer that Daniel was praying leading into God revealing this prophecy to him. Today we're going to get into the first part of the prophecy to see the purpose of it. What's God's purpose in revealing prophetic events to us? So I, I want to encourage you, this is vital to how you handle God's word and how you handle prophecy. There's so much misuse of it, there's so much abuse of it, and that a lot of that would be avoided if we heeded these words we'll hear today in terms of the purpose for why God gives us uh, prophetic knowledge, why he's even spoken in time to his people in this way. So... We're going to pray. We'll dive into this passage a little bit. I'll give you a little uh, context a little bit as we did last week. And then we'll look at, in a sense, the key purpose. I'm going to show you 
I've clumped it into two key purposes that God has for prophecy in your notes, and you can follow along in your notes if you want to. Daniel chapter 9, in your worship guide, there's a page number that goes with that. Uh, You can grab one of the Bibles in front of you and and take you right to that passage, or you can follow along on the screen uh, above us as those passages come up. Let's pray, and we'll take a look at what this passage has to say to us today. Father, uh, we love you and praise you, and we are so grateful um, for a privilege that we so take for granted that we can open up in our hands a a book that's like no other book on this earth. I don't know of any other book that's as ancient as this book that I could get my hands on. Most of the time, you'd have to go to a, a museum, and then it would be behind glass doors, Uh, And you couldn't touch it, but yet the Bible is a book like no other. It it reveals how you have spoken to your people throughout time. Regular people just like us, just like Daniel. People in times of difficulty and people in times of great prosperity. And what I love the most is that it doesn't matter uh, whether the culture in which you spoke into is very different from ours or not the heart issues that you continue to address speak to us as if you were speaking to us today. So, Lord, my prayer is that as we open your word, uh, that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and open our eyes to see what it is you desire to share with us. And that as we understand it, that we would trust you and obey what you shared so that we might become the people that you've called us to be as your church. We love you and look forward to this time with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Daniel, let me just give you, again, a quick synopsis. Daniel is a a leader in in the Babylonian nation. At this point, the Babylonians have just been conquered and the Medes and the Persians have taken over and Daniel's risen to a high place in in the government there. Uh, But the bigger picture is that Israel whom Daniel is a part of the Israelite nation, is in exile. They've been wiped out as a nation. Jerusalem's in shambles here. The temple's ruined, all that kind of stuff. Nebuchadnezzar had taken them captive and brought them to Babylon. And Babylonians try to wash you of all your religion, of all your culture, and enculturate you into their people. And they try to do that with Daniel. Daniel was a man who continued to trust God and do so in a way that was not so, in a sense, in your face to the culture he was in, in a rude way. But yet he held his convictions in a way that's very different than what we see today. We get either the extreme of, I'm going to sit here and bash the government and bash all of our our non-Christian leaders. I'm going to bash the world. That's one form of Christianity. Or we totally incorporate into it and become just like it. Daniel was neither of those. He held to his convictions, but he did it in a respectful and honoring way that allowed him to be put in every single government spot he was in, he was raised to like the right-hand man of these pagan, ungodly leaders because they saw his character as well as how he respected those whom God had put in authority over him. A phenomenal study about how we as Christians should live in a world that's not favorable to who we are. But where Daniel gets this message right here is after uh, years of that, 66 years, he has lived in this condition. He was a teenager when he was taken away. He most likely saw his parents slaughtered before his very eyes. They probably never made the trip. or too old, and the nations at that time would often kill all the old people before they'd exile the young ones whom they wanted to train up into their own system. That was Daniel. Picture that is the start of your life, and then to live in such a way that you faithfully serve the very nation who killed your parents before your very own eyes. 66 years he's been doing that. And he is crying out in this chapter to say, God, what's going on? How long are we going to be here? Because prior to this, God has revealed several visions to Daniel about the coming kingdoms that would rule on the earth, all of them being Gentile nations, meaning non-Jewish nations. 
Daniel's heard these revelations over and over again. And now he gets on his knees as we saw last week and he says, God, what about us? You've made all these promises to us, your people, whom you called out. And yet here we are. How much longer? And he'd studied God's word and he'd seen in the prophet Jeremiah that God had decreed that 70 years his people would be in this exile. It was going to be a discipline for the way they broke God's covenant. And after 70 years, he was going to return them. And Daniel's going, hey, it's 66 years. We're getting close. I'm going to call out to God. I'm going to confess our sins. And I'm going to ask him to begin restoring us just as he promised. And as we come to this passage here, we see that as Daniel is praying this prayer, God sends his servant Gabriel, the angel, in the form of a man to speak this vision, this prophecy to Daniel. And what we're going to see here in the first verse of the prophecy as we get into it is God's purpose, his prophetic purpose for his people. So important that we understand this. And we'll look at the details of it in the weeks to come. So today we're going to see the what. What's God's purpose? Next week we'll look at the when in terms of how he lays it out and says some of these things we're going to handle or happen. And again, we're looking at a huge bird's eye view, like 40,000 feet view. We're not getting into a lot of the details here. We're just understanding the big picture. So let's read and, and see what he says. In verse 20 it says, while I was speaking, this is Daniel, and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. Okay, the holy hill, that was Daniel's metaphor for Jerusalem. That's where Jerusalem and the temple was, was on the holy hill. So Daniel's praying for the Jewish people, the Israelite people, and the city of Jerusalem. He says, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. So this... This just tells us about Daniel here. It's been 66 years since they've lived in Jerusalem. There's no temple. You can't even offer sacrifices anymore because they were to be offered at the temple. And yet 66 years later, Daniel, and if you've read the book of Daniel, you know that Daniel didn't offer sacrifices because they couldn't anymore. It was around the temple. But he would pray at all those times when you normally would have offered a sacrifice. So you see his faithfulness. He knew exactly 66 years. He was a teenage boy after this. He knew this is the timing of it. It was all revolved around his spiritual heritage. It says, he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you. For you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And here it is. We're going to look at just this first verse, verse 24. He says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people. Who are Daniel's people? Daniel's an Israelite, right? Okay, so understand what he's talking about. He's saying 70 weeks are decreed about your people, which is the Israelite people, and your holy city. What's the holy city? Jerusalem, okay? So this prophecy is about the Jewish people, and about the Jewish city of Jerusalem. And then he tells us what it is. He's going to give us six purposes in this next half of the verse. The six purposes that this prophecy is to teach him about. One is to, to finish the transgression. The second is to put an end to sin. The third is to atone for iniquity. And it goes on to, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. Okay, we're going to end right there, and, and I want to take the rest of our time to understand those six purposes. And I'm going to put them into two categories, because I think they break down into two general categories that really capture the purpose of all of God's prophecies when we see them properly. Okay, so the first is, let me just give you the timeline to understand the first part of it. He says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people. This is unfortunate in our modern translations that sometimes people that translate the Hebrew or the Old Testament into English don't always translate it accurately. Uh, this, it's not that this is inaccurate, it just is too specific for what the Hebrew text actually says. The Hebrew text actually says 70 sevens or 70 groups of seven 
were decreed for your people. And, and the word there that's used as sevens can be used in any context. It's kind of like a dozen eggs or a dozen of these. It's just a dozen. It's just sevens. It can be of anything. Some translators just put it as weeks, but the better contextual translation would be years because Daniel's been talking about years. Remember last week we saw that the reason Daniel went to pray is he knew that 70 years had been determined or prophesied that Israel was going to be in exile, and it was about 66 years when this was happening. So he's beginning to pray that God would fulfill his promise to return them after the 70 years. And so when Gabriel comes, he says, yeah, there was 70 years. You saw that in the scriptures, but I'm going to tell you the bigger picture, not just about you returning to the land physically, but there are 70 sevens, 70 groups of sevens or years, because that's what Daniel's been talking about, have been decreed or cut out for your people. And the reason he says it like that, to say decree, the word means to cut out or to, to pull out from something. Daniel had just received all these visions about Gentile nations that were going to be ruling for the next hundreds of years after that. And there was nothing about his people. What about, what about us Jewish people that you made all these promises to God? And so Gabriel comes down and he says, hey, there's, there's still a plan for you all. In fact, there are 70 sevens, there are 70 groups of seven years, 490 years, that are cut out of this history that you've seen for the Gentile nations to rule to accomplish some specific purposes for the Israelite people. Are you with me? So that's what he's saying. It's not necessarily consecutive years. We're going to see the when next week. Today we're just looking at the what. So these are years, and within these years or these time periods that God's going to accomplish these six purposes for the people of Israel and for the city of Jerusalem that he's talking about. The first is to put an end, excuse me, to finish the transgression, to finish the transgression. So be, before we jump into these first three, the first three are all negative things. And if you look at them, they all deal with one particular issue, and that's sin. So what I think we need to see in this first part is that God's prophetic plan, here's your first point, God's prophetic purpose for his people is to deal with sin. That's a purpose of God's prophetic plan. And any kind of prophecy that you deal with, ultimately, even in its specifics, the purpose of, re of God revealing it is because he's showing us, I'm going to deal with sin. I'm going to take care of the problem that you see. In fact, even the whole book of Revelation, when you read it, he, God's dealing with sin and righteousness in the world. That's why he reveals that. Because we as his people... And, and just as human nature, we're going, God, how long are we going to have to deal with all this gunk in the world? How long is all this stuff going to go on? And God in his goodness says, I'm going to take care of it. And the reason he reveals things is to remind us that that's what he's doing. So we're going to see three of these in this first passage. So let's take a look at them one at a time real quick. We'll go through these and hopefully it'll help you understand what they mean. The first is to finish the transgression. So let's take a look at the words that are there and understand what did Daniel say or what did Gabriel say to Daniel. He says to finish the transgression. So to finish is to complete something, to bring it to an end. And then he says something very specific here. He doesn't say a transgression or, or all the transgressions. He says to finish the transgression. He's talking about something specific. And he gets so specific, he doesn't just talk about sins because transgression is a form of sin. He, he uses sin later on. In fact, the next purpose says to deal with sins or to put an end to, or seal up sins. Daniel doesn't use that word here, or Gabriel doesn't. He uses the word transgression. They're related terms, but the term transgression is a much stronger word. It means a rebellious type, willful disobedience against something. Okay, Where the word sin that Daniel uses here later, that Gabriel speaks to him, just refers to what uh, often is used as a definition of sin in the Old Testament. You just missed the mark. You didn't quite hit the target. You may have been intentional, or it may have been unintentional, but you missed the mark. You didn't meet the standard. That's not what transgression means. Transgression means more like you knew the standard, you should have known better, and you, out of your hardness of heart and your just willful rebellion, said, I want nothing to do with that. Are you with me? So the first thing he's talking about is, is he's going to finish the transgression, the issue between God and his people Israel. Now, 
Daniel doesn't know this fully at this point. He's probably seen it because the reason they're in exile is because they've rejected God and his prophets and his truth. But the transgression ultimately they've rejected is going to still come about, and you see it in the Gospels. You see the heart of what this passage is getting at is in this 490 years, the first thing that God's going to have to take care of is he's going to have to take care of the fact that his own people have willfully rejected him. And they've done it by rejecting his provision of a Messiah, Jesus Christ. The New Testament reveals that. Jesus comes and his own people reject him. They want nothing to do with him. And Paul talks about it as well. So the transgression, the thing that has to be finished first for the Israelite people is the first thing God needs to take care of in their problems is he needs to deal with the fact that they have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And until that's finished, until that's taken care of, none of these other things are going to happen. Paul talks about this a little bit in the New Testament. If you uh, flip to Romans chapter 11, it'll come up on the screen here. But Paul talks about this in the greater plan as you see how Jesus Jewish people and Gentiles, us, uh, uh, the church, kind of fit together. And he says in verse 25 of chapter 11, he says, lest you, uh, he's speaking to the Romans here, Gentile people, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. So what's happening is Paul's talking about one of the means in which God's bringing the Israelite people back. As they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, there's this huge influx then of Gentile, non-Jewish people that all believed in the Messiah. And, and the scriptures talk about that flood is going to bring Israel, make the Jews jealous. And in their envy, they're going to return and, and repent and come back and receive their Messiah in time. But that's part of the process by which God's going to put an end to that transgression, their rejection of Jesus Christ. It says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. There it is. He's removing the sin. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they, meaning the Jewish people, are enemies for your sake, you Gentile people. He's saying, in God's plan, part of right now is they've rejected it, but in their rejection, it's, it's let us in. Like, we didn't come in in the Old Testament. We were separated a lot of times. The Gentiles were seen as outsiders. Now we're part of God's people. And he says, for the gifts and the calling, oh, excuse me, but as regards election, meaning God's choosing of the Israelite people, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, meaning he, God's not done with them, They're going to have a plan that we're going to look at here in the the minute. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, meaning the Gentiles were disobedient, we see that in the Old Testament, they wanted nothing to do with God, but now have received mercy because of their, the Jewish people's, disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, that's us, the Gentile believers, they also may now receive mercy, meaning they're going to come back in great numbers because of what God's doing in the Gentile people's lives. And then it tells us this final point. For God has consigned to all disobedience. That word means actually transgression. That he may have mercy on all. So in each of our disobediences, God's used them to bring about his greater purpose in life. And that's what's going to eventually happen with the Jewish people. You see, the greatest problem the Jewish people have is the same problem that you and I have all had. Our problem has never been our daily sins, that we make some mistakes, that we fall short of God. That is a problem, but that's not the greatest problem. Because you could solve that problem, if you could, hypothetically, and it still wouldn't bring you to where you need to be. The greatest problem any person or any people have is rejecting God's provision of a Savior in Jesus Christ. That is the greatest transgression throughout Scripture that we face. And until you address that issue, 
Don't even bother trying to address the issue of your daily sins. You need to deal with what have you done with the provision God has made to deal with your sin and to bring you a righteousness that you could never earn. And so that's where this starts, to deal with the transgression, the Israelite people's rejection of Jesus. The second thing he says in here is to put an end to sin, to put an end to sin or to make an end of sin. It means to close it up or seal it off. And that's dealing with the sins of the people of Israel in general after they've addressed their Messiah. That's not just about forgiving their sins. It means sealing them up so they're not sinning anymore. It's not just forgiveness for their sins. It means, okay, now in a daily way, they're living perfectly righteous. And that's talking about a period in Israelites, uh, Israel's future which Jesus will reign supremely in that city, the holy city, and the people will obey him perfectly. The Bible refers to it as a thousand-year period, a millennial reign where Jesus will live as king over the people of Israel. They'll fulfill all the promises that we see in the Old Testament, and they will actually obey him and follow him as they were intended to do. Jeremiah talks about some of this. Uh, Jeremiah 31, if you flip there, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 uh, and thir- through 34, Jeremiah prophesies about this time when he says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So he's saying it won't be like the Mosaic covenant where I gave them the guidelines of how to live with me faithfully because they weren't able to obey it, just like you and I aren't able to obey it. He's going to make a new covenant with them. He says... uh, I was, uh, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, Jeremiah is talking to the Israelite people here, okay? That's what his prophecy is. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now this has never happened with the Jewish people yet. They don't all know him. They aren't all... Uh, or having the law written on their heart. They know the law. A lot of them can recite the law, but they're not living accordingly, and they're not all knowing him, and they're not all forgiven in that same way. And so Jeremiah is talking about this period where that will happen, where all their sins will be dealt with. They'll have a new heart that God will make for them, and they will live perfectly before him during that time. Now, in that millennial period, there'll be sinful nations outside of it, but it's going to be a, a righteous place in that place that you see in the Bible in Revelation chapter 20 that speaks about that particular time period. The third thing we see in here is that uh, it says to atone for iniquity. That's the third of the dealing with sins, to atone for iniquity. And the term there means to make a satisfactory payment for sin. That in this time period, God is going to make a satisfactory payment for sin. That's why he can deal with their transgression. That's why he can deal with their daily sins, because he's going to make a payment for it. And that payment comes in the person of Jesus Christ. He was prophesying that something's going to happen in these years that's going to make a payment for sin. That's the heart of the first half of this prophecy. You see... Daniel was crying out in this passage for God to restore his people and to bring them back to the land. And that would have made their life better. It would have changed their external circumstances if he brought them back to the land, no doubt. The problem is they would have continued to sin. They would have continued to be who they'd always been. Changing your circumstances never transforms who you are on the inside. And as a result, they would have continued to break God's law and they would have ended right back up in exile just like they had here. History shows that. So God brought an even greater answer to Daniel's prayer. He says, you know what? Better than just bringing you back into the land, I'm going to deal with the sin problem. 
the sin problem that brought you into exile and will keep you in exile indefinitely. I am going to provide a means for that problem to be removed so that exile never has to be a part of your indefinite future. That's the first half. God's prophetic purpose for his people is always to deal with their sin. The second three are the positive ones. It says to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. So the second purpose we see in this passage is that God's prophetic purpose for his people is to make them righteous, to make them righteous. He's going to deal with our sin, and then he's going to make us righteous. Those two things go hand in hand, and they're part of his overall purpose for these, and they're vitally important because simply being forgiven is not enough. You could have all your sins wiped out, and it still will not get you what you need. It won't earn you heaven. It won't put you in eternity simply to have your sins washed away. You have to meet God's perfect standard. And forgiveness is not enough to do that. Let let me illustrate this in a simple, tangible way that might help you understand it, and then we'll work through these. Let's let's pretend you were a football player for your younger part of your life, and and, and during those times that you were playing football, you you broke a few of the rules on on the field. Okay, you were off sides a few times, you had a few illegal blocks, you know, you got a few penalties against you during that time, and, and you know, that, that's part of your football record. And let's say for some reason the, the football league said, we're going to make a way for you to come in and get every penalty that you've ever had on your record removed. All of them. And you say, hey, that sounds great, man. I, wanna, I really want to try out for the NFL, and I'm thinking if I have a, a clean record, that might help me. So you go into the organization, you do exactly what they say, and you get every penalty that you've ever had wiped from your record. This is a hypothetical story, okay? Just an illustration. You get all wiped out, and you're good. Now, let me ask you this. If you were to go to an NFL team and say to them, say, hey, I really want to play for your team. Look, check this out. I don't have one penalty on my record. Not one. I don't have any penalties. I mean, yeah, I know I'm slow. I'm a little overweight. I can't catch worth beans, but, but I don't have one penalty on my record. Not one. How many teams are going to take you? Okay, maybe the Steelers, but let's pretend the Steelers <laughs> aren't part of that. How many teams are going to take you just because you don't have any penalties on your record? Not one. Because if you're going to get into the NFL, you not only have to have a good record, well, not always have to have a good record, but you, you get to understand. You have to perform at a certain level. You've got to have a certain amount of speed. You've got to have a certain amount of strength. You have, a, have to have a certain amount of ability. You have to measure up to a standard, not just have a clean record. That's the only way you will make it into the NFL. And if that's what it takes to get into the NFL, which is an earthly, broken, lower standard organization, do you think it's going to be easier to get into God's perfect kingdom? Absolutely not. The highest standards must be met to get into his kingdom. That's why it's so important to understand in God's prophetic plan, he's not just dealing with our sin. He is making us righteous as well. You see, one of the mistakes we make when we look at the death on the cross is we too often think that Jesus just plopped down here on earth and plopped up on that cross and he took care of our sins. He did do that. But we forget for 30 plus years He resisted every single temptation this world could throw at him. For 30 plus years, he obeyed every single command that God asked of him, even when we mocked him for it. You see, Jesus did not just forgive our sins. He lived the perfect life. He met the standards that you and I need to have to enter eternal life. And he offers them to us through faith. That's what prophecy is all about. It's talking about how God's going to deal with sin and how he's going to make his people 
righteous. So let's take a look at these really quick and see what's going on. The first one he says is, is in this time period that he's decreed for Israel, he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness or an age of righteousness. And this refers again to this period when Christ reigns as an earthly king over his Jewish people. It's what's called the messianic kingdom or the millennial period. Revelation chapter 20 talks about that time period where Satan is bound for a thousand years and, and, the, and Israel and, and the nation of Israel and the Jewish people in Jerusalem is a holy place, a place like it's never ever been on this earth. And all these promises that God made are going to come about. When Jesus comes back bodily to this earth, that's going to be one of the first things that he does, is he ushers in a unique period of righteousness for the people of Israel to fulfill these promises. Jeremiah talks about it, and Ezekiel talk about it. If you flip in your Bibles to Jeremiah 33 and Ezekiel, we'll see in Ezekiel 36, look at what he says here. Uh, The prophet says, Jeremiah 33, 34, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Who are those people? The Jewish people. So he's saying, a day is going to come when I'm going to fulfill my promises to them, and in those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. David being King David, so from the descendant of David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely, and this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Is, are they lacking a man right now? Anyone ruling in Jerusalem right now that's a, a descendant of David? Not happening. And the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to uh, uh, burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. You see Ezekiel also talking about this time period when God gathers his people back to that place and they have, they, they have the fulfillment of these earthly promises that God made to them in verse 24. It starts before that, but time's sake, I can't read it. You can read that whole paragraph if you want later. But he says in verse 24, I will take you from the nations, meaning the Jewish people who have been scattered all over the earth now, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. There he is. He's dealing with their sins. He's forgiving them. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. See, this is what people often mistaken. They just think the new heart and the new spirit is about forgiveness. It's really not. He cleanses them, and then the reason he gives them a new heart and a new spirit is because if I forgave all your guys' sins right now, if I could do that, guess what? You'd already sinned by the time you got back to your car because your heart is broken. He's talking about a period where not only are your sins forgiven like they are in Jesus Christ, but he has put a heart in you that is only going to do what it's supposed to do. Isn't that awesome to think about that? Think if you only wanted to do what God wanted you to do. Because a lot of you are here today not because you want to be here, but you go, oh, man, i got to go to church again. It's Sunday morning. I'd rather stay at home and watch. And you can't say football because it hasn't started, but next week that's what your struggle will be. The day is going to come when you're going to want nothing more than to be in the presence of God. And that's what he's talking about here. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. People, that has never taken place yet for the Israels, for Israel, for the Jewish people. And either God's a liar or God has a plan to fulfill that uh, which we're looking at here and Daniel is hearing from him. So to bring in an age of righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, that's a phrase that just means that all of this, this vision, all these prophets, is like a scroll that's going to be rolled up and stamped and closed up. Or it's a stamp of authentication, meaning all this stuff will be completed. The visions and the, the prophets, everything they've said will be done at the end of this 490 years. Now, what you have to understand is, again, this prophecy was for Israel, not for the church. doesn't mean it doesn't 
overlap a little bit, but he's saying every single prophecy that I spoke to you, the Jewish people, which is in the Old Testament, will be finished after these 490 years are complete. There's new prophetic revelation in the New Testament at the end of Revelation that he's not talking about here. So not all prophecies won't be completed, but everything that he said he was going to do for the Jewish people will be done by the time this 490 years comes to an end. Very important to understand that. And the last thing we see is to anoint the most holy. Uh, literally, that means the holy of holies, which always refers to the temple in the Old Testament. In this case, it refers to a new temple that's described in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46. And you can read that for yourself. We don't have time to go there. But in the end of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, you read about a temple that's going to come that's never been built on this earth yet. Not even close. So either that's a joke and God didn't mean it, or it's talking about this temple that will be part of that millennial kingdom, that period when Jesus reigns on earth with his people, the Jewish people, uh, at that time. So we see that in these passages. Very important you understand what each of these components means as we get into it next week about when they're going to happen. Let me, let me close with this. God revealed the purpose of his future prophetic plan to Daniel, it says in here, because Daniel was greatly loved. Right before he received this, it says, Daniel, you are getting this vision because you are greatly loved. God has preserved these prophetic truths for his people even to see today because you are greatly loved. God tells us these things because he loves us. But let me, just, let me just make this last point. Revealing this prophetic plan was the easiest thing God had to do. It cost him very little to let Daniel in on his plan. But it cost him everything to make this plan possible. Because see, God can say, I'm going to deal with sin and I'm going to make you righteous. But there is only one possible way for him to do that. And that's to have an offering that could truly pay for sin and a life that truly measured up to the righteousness that he would one day give to you and me. Only one person could do that. Daniel, as great a man as he was, as faithful as he was in a pagan nation, his prayers and his life could not substitute for yours and for mine. But God in his goodness spoke to Daniel about one that would. And that person is Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came to live a perfect life and to pay a perfect payment for your sin and for mine. So that as we look forward and we wonder, God, when are you going to deal with sin in this world? God, when are you going to make things right? Daniel didn't have a clear picture. God began to reveal it to him, but Daniel never saw what you and I have seen. That God sent his own son to resist every temptation that this world offers to do everything that his father asked him to do so that he could present himself as the only man who ever lived rightly before God, the only person to ever earn eternity. And when he should have immediately received his reward, instead, he died like the worst of criminals. I mean, Jesus knew coming to earth I'm going to live a perfect life, God, and then you're going to discipline me. You're going to pour out your wrath on me like I was the worst human being to ever live. You know, what kind of deal is that? It was the only deal that could save you and I from our sin and could credit our broken, bankrupt accounts with a righteousness that would let us spend all of eternity with him. So church, as we look into prophecy, as we look into this truth, 
my prayer is that we wouldn't become a people who wield these prophecies like it's some kind of hammer or some kind of sword that we can knock other people over the head with. Instead, that we would see the purpose for which God gives them to deal with sin in his people and to deal with righteousness because God is dealing with those things in your life and in mine. And Daniel knew that. He cried out for his own people. He said, God, forgive us. We're the problem because if we would know that you're going to deal with sin and if we knew that you were bringing in righteousness, we would live differently and we wouldn't have to speak nearly as much, Lord, because our lives would be prophetic lives. They would be lives that people would look at and say, why does that guy live like that? I mean, Daniel, of all people, could have been the most corrupt person in all the kingdom. He had access to everything the king had access to. He could have taken bribes. He could have lived debaucherously. He could have slept with anyone he wanted to. He was in a position to do that. And he lived like he was living for a different kingdom. He lived like he knew God was going to deal with sin and he was going to bring in righteousness. And without hardly saying a word, Daniel impacted some of the greatest leaders in all the world of that time. Because they looked at him and said, this man is different. He serves a different God. He's living for a different kingdom. I wonder what our city would think. If every week hundreds of people launched out into it and began living like they knew that God was going to deal with sin. They started living like they knew he was getting ready to make them righteous. I wonder how different our city could be if we recognized that the purpose for God telling us about the future is so that we will live today in light of what we know is going to be true tomorrow. Church, that's my prayer for us as a church. That's my hope in my own life, that I'd be the first one to say, God, deal with what you need to deal with in my life. Help me to be righteous so that I can make you known in a city that deeply needs to see a righteousness that only comes from you. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful. We are so blessed to be able to hold in our hands a book like this with messages like these that are so pertinent for our day and age. But Lord, all books aside, what we need more and what you sent to complete it was not a book not just a message it was a person it was the word it was your son he is the heart and soul of all prophecy he either fulfills our prophecy or he has been the very power that makes it possible for you to accomplish everything you said you're going to accomplish he dealt with our sin he lived a righteous life all of which summarizes everything that we are learning lord jesus we praise you we thank you for fulfilling for us what we could never have done for ourselves. So make us holy. Help us to see who you want us to be in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our city, in this world, so that we might live lives of prophetic purpose. In Jesus' name we pray.